You know, every week when we open up the, uh, every week we go and we open up God's word, right? And when we, uh, we've sung and we've centered our hearts and our attention towards God, and then we want to be prepared for us to dive into the word because we believe that God's word changes lives. Uh, we believe it is God's word. In fact, I'd even just make this statement that if God were to speak audibly, that doesn't have more authority than if we were to open up the word, and read from here. It is the voice of God, it is the word of God for life, for us, for today, and it has great ability to change our lives, for, for the Holy Spirit to illuminate his, illuminate his word and give us understanding as we dive into the word, right? And so we want to know what God's word says, and we want to not just know about it, but we want to apply that into our lives. And when we do apply God's word into our lives, what do we find? We find that we have a whole new perspective on not just our view of who God is and getting to know him better and love him more, but when we do that, we find that we also love others more. And we find that as we know more about God and love God more, one of the things that happens, a, a, a result of that is that our whole perspective of life changes. So for instance, if you're going through crisis this morning, the more that you know of who God is and how great he is and what God has done, it's going to change your perspective regarding that crisis that you're in. Or, or maybe you see a trial that's coming up uh, ahead of you and you're like, oh man, I'm dreading that. Or maybe you're even dreading going to work tomorrow. Uh, most people are. Uh, I'm not. I'm a pastor, so I'm off till next Sunday. But uh, 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 <laughs> We have staff early tomorrow morning, by the way. But uh, so we, uh, you know, whatever is coming ahead of you, you, it, God's word, as you know him more and grow in him more, it allows you, right, to be able to see things. It's through a filter, so th seeing through things through God's eyes. And it changes the perspective of everything. So that's why we open up God's Word. Every week we dive into the Word. What does God have to say to us? So we've been uh, recognizing the fact that we don't want to just check boxes, right? I mean, we're, we're here. When we gather together on a Sunday morning, we don't want to just go through the motions. We want substance. We don't want to be just Christianish, as we've been talking about. We want to be full-on Christians. Am I right? Okay, good. Thank you. There's at least one of you. Good. I saw some nods. I'll give that to you. It's early. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't want it to go through the motions. I want something real that's going to change my life, change my perspective, help me to be able to know God and grow in him so I can walk in him. So 1 John has been a great book, a great study. In fact, there's only a couple, I think it's five weeks left that I plan on going through uh, before we finish up 1 John. But we've been going through this book. And in 1 John, he's been bringing up a number of, of themes that continue to continue to repeat in. And so, in fact, I want to point you to a summary that John, the author of 1 John, is going to be able to give us. So here's a summary of what 1 John is about. So turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. Right near the end of your Bible, so if you're just joining us in the study of 1 John, you picked a great day to do that. 1 John, right near the end, the very last book of the Bible is Revelation, right? And then you're going to need to go just a couple pages to the left, and you're going to come across 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Jude. And we're going to come into 1st John chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. And John is now, he's, he's starting to wind down in his letter, and he's going to give us the three main points of what 1st John is about. You can see him on the screen here. Uh, Right belief, number two, genuine love, and three, ongoing obedience. Here's where they are at. Take a look. 1 John 3, 23. Now, this is his, God's command, and here they are, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. There's one. Right belief. We need to have right belief. If we're going to grow in him, that's what John's been about, right? If we're going to have a close walk with him, if we're going to walk closely with the Lord, we need to have right belief. We need to know who God is and what he said. How do we know that? Just by what we feel, just get warm fuzzies? No, we get it from God's word, right? So God has revealed himself through his word. So right belief, two, and love one another as he commanded us. Oh, as he commanded us. Oh, that's a nice little side note, by the way. Not as I want, necessarily, but as he commanded. So genuine love, 
Number two. And number three, out of here, 24, the one who keeps his commands remains in him and he in him. So there's ongoing obedience, ongoing obedience. And John has brought that up numerous times as we've gone through here, hasn't he? So right beliefs, genuine love, and ongoing obedience. Those are the three main themes that 1 John continues to drive out. And here we have a summary of that here in in chapter 3. So we've been seeing a lot of these different things, and I uh, am looking forward to what we're going to do is we're going to finish chapter 3 this morning uh, in our study. But as we're going through here, we've, we've seen that repeatedly throughout this book, supposing that we're in Christ, so the presupposition that I am supposing that you're a believer in Christ. You've trusted in Christ. You've believed in him. You've trusted him. We're Christians. Now that we're Christians, now that we have a desire, if this is you, like if this explains you, you're like, that's what I want. I want right belief. I want genuine love. I want ongoing obedience. I want that. I desire to please God. If that's you, you're a Christian. And if that is you, you have now been justified, declared righteous. You're saved. There's salvation. And now you're being sanctified, a process of becoming more like Christ, right? So I'm growing in Christ. I'm maturing in him as I continue to to grow on. And so these three things are continued things that I want to be able to do. I want to continue to grow in him. Now, if you're walking in him, as you walk in him, one of the things that you're going to do constantly and regularly is fail miserably. You're going to sin. We know that because we've already been studying that in 1 John. So we know that we're going to continue to sin. And so what do we do when we sin? Well, we, we repent from that, right? We confess to the Lord. And then one of the things that also happens in our hearts and as we deal with this sin battle in us is that in that, we, uh, our hearts may very well try to condemn us. Our hearts may very well try to condemn us. And so what do we do with the sin and with the failure in our lives? Because I really want that. I want to walk closely with him. I want to grow in him. That is my deep desire. I want to do that, but I fail miserably. So what do I do? What do I do in my heart tells me I'm such a loser? How do I deal with that? Well, John is going to answer that for us. And one of the things I love out of this is that we're going to see out of the rest of here of chapter 3 from verses 19 through 24, what we're going to see is that there's three benefits that come from walking closely with the Lord. The first of which is this. There is going to be assurance of salvation. The first benefit that we're going to see of walking closely with the Lord is assurance of salvation. Number two. Answers to prayer. I don't know if anybody has a desire for answered prayers uh, here, but uh, good. We're going to dive into that a little bit. We'll see that. And three, the benefit of walking closely with the Lord is the constant presence and empowering of the Spirit of God in your life. So if you're writing that down, you can take a picture, whatever. It's going to be up there the rest of our our time here. So uh, that's there for you. We can benefit from that. Can can you benefit from any one of these or all three? Is anybody? Um, Good. Thank you, Bryce, Dan. Awesome. Good. That's great. Um, Well, let's pray and ask God to guide us through his word here. Father, thank you for our time to be able to open up your word. And we do, I, I beg of you, Lord, would you illuminate your word. Help us to see what you are saying to us so that we can apply it into our lives and be changed and transformed. And and God, we just ask that you would breathe life, a breath of fresh air into our lives this morning because we have spent time in your word. We ask this in your great name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me read just verses 19 through 21. It's going to be our first point that John draws for us. Look at verse 19. This is how we will know that we belong to the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. Dear friends, 
if our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence before God. So the first thing that John is bringing out for us is he's talking to fully devoted followers of Jesus, right? These are full-on Christians, fully devoted followers of Jesus who are walking with the Lord and we experience real change, real hope, and real life in this. And, and in this letter, one of the things that in this letter we've seen so far and we'll continue to see as we finish our study in 1 John is that as we go through here, we come head to head with some topics and some issues that causes us, it should cause us to have to examine our hearts, to examine, God, do I really know you? Do I know you? Or am I just Christianish? Do I know about you? Or do I know you? So that, that's been coming up over and over and over again in, in 1 John. But John doesn't want us to land at this place, to constantly be in this place where like, well, I wonder if I'm saved. Gosh, I don't know. I hope I'm saved. Well, gosh, remember you did this? Oh, yeah, maybe I'm not saved. Well, maybe I am. And, and going back and forth. He doesn't want you having to play ping pong back in your mind, back and forth over whether you're saved or not. He wants you to have assurance. In fact, one of the things that I see in this passage is this, <sighs> take a breath. He's writing to believers. And he wants to reassure us as believers in Christ, hey, relax. God is really big. God is at work. He, John wants you to know that we're going to sin and fall away uh, and, and along the way. We're going to fall all along the way. But he knows that our hearts are also going to try to condemn us. Verse 20, whenever our hearts condemn us. So this is a little bit of a moment here to step out of the, the flow to, okay, relax. We're going to look at the goodness of God, not my goodness, but the goodness of God. We're going to look to God. And so he's addressing every Christian who loves Jesus and desires to, to grow in him, desires to walk in him, desires to please God. That's who he's writing to. That's I virtually, I believe, everybody who's, who's watching right now. If that's you, then this is for you. So whenever our hearts condemn us, this is when we fall, when we sin, we, we, we blow it. And truth be told, right? Guilty is charged. And our hearts begin to condemn and beat us down. Here's what I mean when our hearts condemn us. You may hear things like, You call yourself a Christian. Who are you kidding? Who do you think you are? How can you be such a loser? You're fooling yourself if you think you can be a witness to others. All the things, and it just, your heart begins to bring up all the issues and all the problems. You know better than that, you loser. condemnation. How do I know about that condemnation? Because I know that voice far too well. Personally, I, I, I know that beating up, condemning heart of mine that will beat me mercilessly. And uh, in fact, Angie and I have a, a, a nickname for that voice it's called Mick, my inner critic. <laughs> and my inner critic is ruthless. And over time, what I've been able to do is to recognize the voice. Because it's not the voice of my shepherd. It's not the voice of God. But I can tell you, I have that voice and I know that voice well. Martin Luther also had that voice as well, fighting enemies, attack of the enemy. In fact, Martin Luther is said to, this is back in the 1500s, 16th century, that Martin Luther was attacked by the enemy, and at the middle of the night, he took his inkwell, and he threw it against the wall, trying to silence the, the voice that 
condemnation, of his sin. We have that voice. So when our, whenever our hearts condemn us, what do we do? Now, now John isn't talking about, I don't believe he's talking about here, that he's, he's speaking about when the Holy Spirit convicts us. That's different. That's a different voice. The conviction of the Spirit of God when he's convicting us, pointing out areas of unrepented sin, unconfessed sin. That's a different voice. This condemnation, I believe, is the voice that comes in and moves in after that and beats us mercilessly. The Holy Spirit is completely different. The Holy Spirit's gentle. The Holy Spirit, when he convicts of sin, is specific, not just general. One of the ways of recognizing the voice, specific. Hey, the way you responded to that person was wrong. You didn't make that right. Very specific. Ooh, yeah, you're right. Specific. Not just, you're such a loser. The Holy Spirit doesn't condemn. He's gentle. So what do we do about the hearts that condemn us? Whenever our hearts condemn us, well, John tells us, look to God. Look at the rest of verse 20. We have, uh, for God is greater than our hearts, and he knows all things. God is greater than our hearts. He knows all things. If you mark in your Bible, you can underline all things. (laughs) All things. He knows all things. He is completely, God is omniscient. There's the big 50 cent word for the morning, omniscient. He knows all things, completely knows it all. He's, there's complete sovereignty with God. There is complete power with God, complete control and authority with God. He knows all things, is in control of all things. He is all-powerful, almighty. He is God, and he is greater than our hearts. He knows all things. He knows all things. That means he knows every single thing about you. Nothing is hidden. Nothing. Nothing is overlooked. Nothing is missed. Every action, every thought, every desire. He knows all things. He knows that you want to check out and check your Facebook right now. He knows that you're looking at your clock wondering when we're done. He knows that. He knows everything. There's nothing that he misses. When I was getting inspected in, in the Marines by my first sergeant, we, every Thursday was inspection day. And a first sergeant would come in. He was big. He was big. And he'd come in. He's like, this doesn't look clean at all. Like we did everything uh, we're supposed to for a second. He would he'd go to the urinal. He would stick his head. He's he's bald. He'd stick his head to look at the rim of the urinal to make sure that was clean. He'd stick his finger in the overflow of the sink, the drain. I thought you said everything was clean. You got me first, Sergeant. Come back tomorrow. I'm like, oh, guess what we're doing Thursday night. Cleaning again. He knew everything, I thought. He doesn't know everything. God knows everything. God knows it all. He knows everything. And, and, and with that truth, that is, that's sobering and incredibly humbling when you think about the fact that God knows your thoughts and your desires In spite of knowing all of that, we can rest and experience peace. Why? 
the reason why we can land that God is greater than our hearts that are condemning us is because of verses like Romans 8.1, because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can take that to the bank. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because what God has forgiven stands forgiven forever. For as far as the east is from the west, as far as God has removed our sins from us. A promise you can take to the bank. Because Romans 8, 31 to 34, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of, the, of God, who indeed is interceding for us. That's why. That's why when my heart condemns me, I turn to the Lord. That's why I turn to God. It's why I turn to worship, just like Scott said earlier. One of the things when, man, I'm feeling beat down, you know what I do? I grab my guitar and I start worshiping. You know why? Because it changes my heart and my perspective because I want to turn to God. I want to worship him. Because the heart that's condemning me isn't true. I can cry out like Peter did in John 21. Lord, you know all things. And you know that I love you. We rest, so we will rest, not in, not in our good works, but God, remember this, 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 and this? <laughs> but we're going to rest in his good works. See the difference? The work upon the cross and it was because of that when he said, it is finished, that he declared to those of us who believe in him that we are clean, there's no condemnation. And then he says here in verse 21, dear friends, you hear that, that gentle voice of, of John as he writes? Dear friends, if our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence before God. There's a confidence to come to God. We have the ability to be able to go to him. When, when, I was a, when I was a kid, I remember watching over and over again on my VHS uh, movies, uh, The Wizard of Oz. So great old 1939 film, The Wizard of Oz, and I remember watching that, and you have Dorothy and her three friends, right? You have the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Lion, good, and uh, so all of those, uh, remember they're coming down the, the long hallway into where the doors begin to open up, and then right behind those doors is the Great Oz, and you remember how they approach? They they come and they're 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 trembling and they're standing there. And then finally, Oz, the great Oz, speaks up and says, uh, "Come forward, there, Tin Man." And you hear the clanking Tin Man coming up, and he's he's just just shaking like crazy, and, and everything is is he's just terrified before before him. And the great Oz speaks up, and that as the music starts to rise and everything, and out of this the 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 great Oz speaks up and says, he says, do you dare come to me and ask for a heart? You clinking, clanking, clattering collection of junk. Is that how you feel when you approach the throne of God? Is, is that how you approach? Is that what it means that the fear of the Lord quaking, can't believe I'm even here. Of course not. We, we have confidence. We have confidence to be able to come to him. If our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence before God. Hebrews 4.16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of God, that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. Just a few chapters later in Hebrews 10, 
uh, 19, it says, We have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. We come to God with confidence. That, that fear, that timidity, it, it melts away. We have confidence because God wants us to approach him. We have confidence because of what Christ has accomplished on the cross. We have confidence because of what he's done. So, so we, get this, we get to call out to God. We get to call upon him. We get to, to call on him, and it's, it's no trouble to come to him. He, he wants you to. He, he wants you to seek him and to fall upon him and to, to come before the Lord. You're not a burden to God. Do I need to say that again? You are not a burden to God. And as we walk in him, we have assurance of what he has done and who he has made us. We have confidence and we can run to God. You get to run to God. Don't hesitate. That's not all the benefits that we have as we desire to walk in him and grow in him. We also see answered prayers. The Lord answers prayers. Look at verse 22. And receive whatever we ask from him because we keep his commands and do what is pleasing in his sight. Man, is that an incredible thought and idea? We receive whatever we ask from him. God answers prayer. Now, we'll unpack this all the more in a couple of weeks because this comes up again in John, 1 John chapter 5. So I'll spend more time talking about maybe the ups and downs of this. But just on the surface level here, I don't want us to miss the fact that God answers prayer. He wants us to come to him with confidence and call out to him and beg of him and to seek him. And as we walk in him, we want to find answers to prayer from God, and we, we know, right, that this isn't, uh, we, we can't cherry pick this and go, well, here is the secret, it's the secret verse to unlocking God to be able to answer everything we want, right? Obviously, that's, that's not what, that would be taking us out of context. When we pray to God, it's about us coming under his authority under his perfect will, not my, uh, my failing, my flawed will. When we come to God and seek him, we, we desire to please him and desire for him to work. And as we grow in him, we also find that our prayers become less and less about selfish gain and more about his work in, in our lives and in the solution and in the problem or what's going on. So we don't want to go, oh, this is a sweet, this is a blank check that God wrote for us. <laughs> that wouldn't be, I mean, that wouldn't be a loving father to give us whatever we ask. What father is going to give their child whatever they ask for? That wouldn't be loving. If you as a father were to give everything that your child asks for, you're going to raise a very selfish child and self-centered, right? Growing Christians want to see God glorified and see him shine. We pray according to his will. We, we, we want to see him accomplish his purposes, And so we know that God, God will answer our prayers. It may not always be the way we want, but he will always answer. And he will always do what is going to allow him to shine, allow him to work. So John wants us to live in obedience to the word and the will of God, and our prayers will be reflected in his will so that we'll see We'll see answered prayer 
prayer is like, oh, Lord, help me. Guide me. God, I don't know what to do. But my eyes are fixed upon you. Prayer of Jehoshaphat. Guide me and guard me from making mistakes, God. God, what do I do now? A regular prayer of angels of mine in the morning is, God, nothing more and nothing less than what you've called for us to do. When we pray according to God's will, he's eager to answer those. He will guide us. He's eager to answer so So my encouragement to you out of this whole thing of of answered prayer and receiving whatever we ask for him because we continue to grow in him or want to walk in him and see answered prayer, my encouragement is don't stop praying. Don't stop calling upon the Lord. And and go, go, go with confidence to God. Go with confidence to him. What a privilege that that we have as children of God to be able to go immediately to the throne room at any time, anywhere you are. Anytime, anywhere. And you're not a burden. What a privilege. The benefits of walking with him is that we have assurance of salvation. We have answered prayers. And finally here, we have the constant presence and empowering of the Spirit of God. Look at verses 23 and 24. Now this is his command. We saw this earlier, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. We love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commands remains in him, and he in him. And here we go. And the way we know that he remains in us is from the Spirit He has given us. Now, he gives us the spirit of God. We've talked about this a number of times already here in 1 John. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the spirit of God is in you. He's given you the spirit of God. You have access to God constantly. He is the spirit of God. And, And so Christians have the spirit of God in them. He is the one who is available for you. He's here for you. The Holy Spirit is the one who, the Holy Spirit, he illuminates his word. He helps us to to see and to understand and read and and understand his word. He illuminates his word. He empowers us to follow him and to love others. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. The Holy Spirit is the one who gifts us for ministry. He's the one that, uh, that leads us and, and guides us. And he says, go this way. Walk this way. He guides us. The Holy Spirit is the one who assures us of salvation in him. He's the one who empowers us to live out our walk with God. We can't do that on our own power. Just read John 15. We've got to abide in him. Remain in him but he has been given to us. Every believer has the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And so as we trust in him, as we walk in him, we continue to to hear him and and to to follow him and to, we, we experience these benefits. Assurance answers the prayer being empowered by the Spirit of God. Benefits of continuing, of growing in Him, and and that's really this this breath we get to take out of 1 John and go, this is what I want. This is what I need. I need this. I want this. I want to grow in these. The treasures that we have in Christ far outweigh any of the passing pleasures the world offers. We need more of of Christ, more of him. Frankly, Jesus is better. When you look at this list, 
where's your heart this morning? Needing some assurance? Maybe your heart's been condemning you. It's been brutal. Need some answered prayers? Don't stop praying. Don't stop pleading to the Lord. Fall on your knees by the side of your bed. What if that was the very first place you went in the morning? The alarm goes, uh, you turn it off, and you roll out of bed onto your knees. Answered prayer. Don't stop praying. Don't stop pleading for the Lord to answer. He will answer. Maybe you need to be empowered by the Spirit of God because, and you're so weak right now, and you're struggling. So God, I need, I need to know your presence is with me, and I need to know that you are not going to leave me or forsake me. That's a promise of yours. Well, it almost sounds like a prayer, doesn't it? God, I need you, so help me to walk in you. He will gladly give you strength for the moment. If you're worried about tomorrow, by the way, what does Matthew 6 say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for each day is enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow. He's not going to give you the strength for tomorrow, today. He'll give that to you tomorrow. But today, trust in him today. benefits of walking closely with God. Oh, how we want that and need that. Let's pray. Father, what a privilege we have to come immediately before your throne. What a privilege that we get to immediately just say, God, help. God, minister. (laughs) Thank you for never forsaking us. God, I pray and ask that you would minister to our hearts this morning, giving us an assurance of who we are in you. God, of answered prayer, help us to not lose heart in praying. And God, may we be empowered by the Spirit of God because we have trusted in you. For you are better than all things. You know all things. You are greater than our hearts. You are Lord. Thank you. Amen.